Hello and welcome to the talk on our paper, Single Trace Attacks on Ketchuk. Uh, this is joint work by Matthias Kahnwischer of Rapport University in Nijmegen, uh, Robert Primas of Graz University of Technology, and myself, Peter Bessel. Uh, at the time of writing, I was also with Graz University of Technology. Uh, so with this title, Single Trace Attacks on Ketchuk, you might wonder, well, Ketchuk, as used in SHA-3, SHAKE, uh, is, is, is a hash function. Do we even care about sidechain security of hash functions? Well, there are certain applications and uses of hashes which do involve some keys. You now probably think of an HMAC. But uh, HMAC is in a classic DPA setting anyway. So uh, there we have that we have a fixed secret key that is combined with lots of known and varying input data. And we know that uh, side channel attacks work quite well in this setting and the threat is already quite obvious. Now, Ketchuk, however, has found a lot of different uh, uses in the last couple of years, which involve some sort of secret. And many of these uh, uses are in context of post-quantum crypto. Uh, in PQC, it is frequently used to derive a shared, the final shared secret in a key encapsulation mechanism. Uh, uh, Ketchuk, as in uh, Shake, is also frequently used to expand a short secret seed into a longer random and still secret bit stream. It's used both in CAMs and signatures. And of course, you can also use Ketchuk in hash based signatures. Now, what's interesting about these applications is not only that they involve some secret, but also that they that the secret is an ephemeral one, so uh, this is, it's used once and then tossed out. This also means that a side channel attack is limited to observing a single execution and then he has to, has to try to, to recover the secret key using just this single measurement. Or uh, more correctly speaking, in some of these settings, uh, side channel attack can get more traces, but uh, since of a single key, but since all the other data is then constant, you can do at most averaging, but still no DPA. So in, in this setting, one has to wonder, well, are attacks even possible here anymore? Or uh, so are countermeasures still needed? Or can we assume that an attack uh, doesn't have any chance of recovering the secret of this limited information anyway? Uh, in this paper, we answer these questions and show that yes, attacks are still very much possible and quite realistic, and thus, yes, countermeasures are still needed. Uh, and we show all that by presenting a practical single trace attacks, a uh, single trace attack on Ketchuk software implementations. Uh, our attack uh, uses the framework of soft analytical sidechain attacks, SASCA, which involves two steps. First is a template matching, which means we retrieve leakage probabilities of all intermediates throughout the execution of the cryptographic primitive. And the second step is uh, belief propagation, which is an efficient way to combine now all the probabilities of all these intermediates and allows to infer the most likely key used. Now, these soft analytic side channel attacks are new, but thus far they were mainly used uh, in context of the AES, which is structurally quite different uh, from Ketchup, uh, and was also used uh, with 8-bit leakage, and we tried to extend this to 16 or 32-bit leakage. And actually, this attack can recover the key in a large array of settings, and thus we show that countermeasures cannot be omitted. And we also show several factors that influence the success rate of the attack. Some are obvious, like the key size and the bit width of the device. Some less obvious, like the structure of the input. I'll come back to that later on. Now, before I can uh, explain our attack, I have to briefly explain uh, the inner workings of Ketchuk. Uh, Ketchuk uses a cryptographic sponge with a 1600 bit state, meaning that uh, this state is split into two parts, the first part of size R, the second part of size C. And then it absorbs uh, the input, so this is by XORing a block of the message onto the first part, and then uh, calling an F permutation, and after the whole message is absorbed, uh, the, uh, the uh, hash is squeezed out, and the, if you need a longer hash, then again, this is uh, uh, interrupted by calls to the F function.
as an F function, Katchik uses the Katchik F permutation, which interprets the 1600 bit state in a 3D array in a cuboid of size 5 by 5 times 64. And then it applies uh, five transformations uh, on, on this 1600 bit state. First step is theta, which computes the parity of each column and then XORs it onto some bits. Uh, second step is row, which rotates each lane, so this uh, long section along the c-axis, which offsets size 64 with some given offset. Uh, the third operation is pi, which reorders the lanes. Then we have chi, which is the nonlinear operation, the s-box with a simple uh, description of with simple logic gates. And finally, yeah, we have iota, which is the addition of a round constant. Uh, now, what does it actually mean to attack Kachuk? Well, uh, we assume that we work with an unprotected software implementation on a microcontroller. Unprotected since we want to find out uh, if an unprotected implementation can you can still be attacked with a single trace. And now we, we need, of course, uh, to attack something. We need to have that some part of the input is secret. And unlike AES or any other block cipher where we have a dedicated part uh, input for the secret and a dedicated input for cipher text or plain text, uh, Ketchuk or a hash just has an input. So we need that some part of the input is secret and we also have that this part is used only once. And then, of course, we have an attacker, side channel attacker, which does, for instance, a power measurement of this single execution. And since there is only a single execution, he can't really do a differential uh, side channel attack like in a classic uh, DPA. So we have to resort to some sort of template attack. Uh, here, I'd like to go on a bit of a tangent. Uh, so, Template attacks are typically considered to be quite uh, a strong attacker model, quite restrictive, because usually you need uh, to, to build the templates, you need some templating device which you have already broken, which where you know the key, or you need a device which is fully open where you can set it, and that's very similar to the attack device. But then you also have the, pro the top problem of portability of templates between the devices when you uh, build your profile on one device and want to attack a different device. It's quite tricky. But the situation is a little bit different for the catcher actually, because uh, inside, for instance, in the, any public key scheme, uh, we have often multiple calls to the hash function. And some of these calls work with entirely known data. For instance, the first thing you do in a, in a signature operation is you hash the message, which is known. Uh, also, many post-quantum uh, key encapsulation schemes require some re-encryption step. And, uh, and if the attacker is the one who generated the ciphertext, then, well, he knows all the inputs to the re-encryption as well, since he did the encryption. Now, what I want to say with all this is that in many scenarios, it is actually possible to, to build the profiles directly on the target device by exploiting these calls to catch up that use entirely known data. So you don't need a separate profiling device and you don't have any portability problems. Now, how does the attack actually work? The first step in the attack is template matching. Uh, typically, software implementations of Ketchup work along the lanes of the state, so along the 64-bit parts. So uh, we think that the lanes are split up into bytes or 16-bit or 32-bit words. And then uh, for templating, we target all loads and stores from end to SRAM. And the template attack gives then a, a uh, probability vector to each uh, processor word that is loaded and stored from SRAM. Now we have all these uh, distributions for each uh, processor word and we can to combine all this information to find the one most likely key. And one very efficient method that can achieve this are soft analytical side channel attacks uh, proposed by Vela Chan Yo et al. at Asiacrypt 2014. Now how such a uh, soft analytical side channel attack works is the following. 
Uh, first, we need to build a factor graph, which is a, a graphical model of the implementation of the cryptographic primitive. This graph consists of two sets of nodes. The first are variable nodes, which model the intermediates that occur during the execution of the algorithm. And the second set are the factor nodes, which describe uh, how the variables uh, are connected to each other, how they interact with each other. For instance, on the factor graph on the right, uh, where we have three variable nodes, x, y, and z, and they are connected by an XOR, so that we have x, x or y, x, x or y equals z. In the next step, we incorporate the leakage information that we got from the template uh, attack in the graph. So assume that we have uh, leakage information on x, y, and z. And then we run belief propagation on this graph. And belief propagation is quite a versatile algorithm, has lots and lots of uses, and its general goal is to find marginals of, of the variables inside this graphical model. It does so by using the uh, message passing principle. So for instance, it takes the information of X and Y, uh, combines them according to the rules of the XOR and sends this information over to C. This combination, the simplest form of combining X and Y is by simply enumerating all possible inputs of X and Y, all possible combinations. And now we can do the same in a different direction, and here it's uh, important to avoid circular reasoning. So uh, the, the, the uh, information sent uh, in the direction of X must not uh, depend on the previous information that X sent to the other nodes, which means that for C we take the original distribution, not the updated one. And finally, we can do the same in the y direction, and we have updated probabilities, which we can send out to further nodes. Now, how might this work for Ketchuk? Well, Ketchuk uses bitwise operations, so it's quite natural to use a bitwise factor graph. So for each bit after each uh, five of the five steps of Ketchuk, we instantiate 1,600, uh, one, we instantiate the variable node. As it turns out, however, this doesn't really work all that well, and this is because leakage, we get leakage not on a single bit, but on full processor words, byte 16 bit words. And if we now split up this leakage information into bits, then we lose lots of the joint information that is in the leakage. So we solve this problem by introducing clustering. So we cluster multiple bits into a single variable node, and since we have leakage along the lanes, it's also natural to cluster the bits along the lanes. And ideally, we, uh, we set the cluster such that uh, no side channel information is spread over uh, multiple clusters. Ideally, we would like to have the clusters as large as possible, but there we have runtime and memory consideration because these are exponential in the cluster size, So, which means we, we support 8 and 16-bit clusters. Now, with this cluster, we also run into problem of misalignment of clusters. So previous uh, works on Saska on the AES, well, AES, uh, is uh, completely bitewise oriented, so you'll never have any alignment problems. Uh, on Ketchuk, however, uh, the operations are not necessarily aligned if you have clusters smaller than 64 bits. For instance, consider this operation where we have a word A that is XOR with a rotated version of a word B. So uh, we have to XOR one cluster of A with two parts with parts of two clusters of B. And what we have to do here is we need to split the clusters of B and we have to extract the marginals of the upper parts of one word of one cluster and the lower parts of another cluster and combine them together. We lose some information on the joints there, but we have to truly prove that. There are a couple other uh, considerations uh, for uh, uh, soft analytically side channel attacks on Ketchuk. 
For instance, the very first computation that Ketchik does is the computation of the column parity. So you take five words and x run together, and you could model this with a series of two input x ors, but this uh, doesn't really work all that well with the propagation, at least slow propagation. Uh, so we in instead instantiate a five input XOR node. Here we have the problem, as I said earlier, the simplest way of combining all of these informations now is to, is to enumerate all the inputs. If we have eight bit clusters and five inputs, that would be two to the 40 possible input values, which is not really practical to enumerate. But here, however, there is a solution is, uh, by using the, a fast convolution of the distributions using a Walsh Hadamard transform. There are a couple of other considerations that we have to uh, that we have to deal to get an, a, an efficient attack. For instance, for Kai, we have to break up the clusters again into single bits to deal with invertibility problems. And for 32-bit leakage, we have to combine multiple 32-bit words, um, multiple 8-bit clusters into. Uh, and we have to combine them using with the 32-bit leakage information. And we also found an efficient method to, to do this. Uh, and this method uses convolution instead of enumeration. OK, now um, we implemented all this in Python. And we put all the source code on GitHub. Uh, all our, our attacks, we restrict ourselves to the first two rounds of Ketchuk F. This is just to, to keep the runtime a bit lower. And we found that operation uh, leakage from the from the rounds uh, later on in Ketchuk don't really propagate to the input anymore, where we have our secret. Uh, Ketchuk uh, belief propagation is an iterative algorithm, and each iteration updates the, each distribution once. And if we have 8-bit clusters, then this uh, entire operation takes a couple of seconds on a single core. With 16-bit clusters, the runtime of one BP iteration rises to a minute. And it also uses all 44 cores on our cluster. So it can still be, so it can still be considered practical. Thankfully, though, 8-bit clusters are sufficient in most of the cases anyway. And BP is an iterative alg uh, algorithm, so we keep repeating these iterations until we, we, we reach a point of convergence. And this is if the attack succeeds, typically in less than 10 iterations. OK, now we evaluate this attack. And just to recall, we want to recover some secret input of Ketchak F of the, of the permutation. Uh, as an evaluation tool, we use leakage simulations, meaning that we generate noisy Hemingway leakage of loads and stores at typically locations where software implementations loads and store from SRAM. Uh, we evaluate eight, six, 16, and 32-bit implementation, and we sweep across the noise parameter sigma. And for each uh, selection of sigma, we retrieve compute a success rate. We also analyze the impact of the key size, so we evaluate 128 and 256-bit keys. Apart from these more obvious factors that influence the success rate, there's another factor that is less obvious, and that is uh, the, the content of the, pub of the public input. Uh, remember, the Ketchuk F input, some part is secret, some part is known. And as it turns out, the content of the public part uh, quite drastically impacts the success rate of our attack. And here we have a look at two, uh, the two most extreme scenarios. The first we call all zero public input. This can happen, for instance, if we just hash the, seed, the secret seed. So, so the, uh, the seed is in the first bits of M0, which is XOR down to the zero state. And then the other parts of the state is still zero before it goes into catch F. There are a couple of padding bits, but we can uh, neglect those. 
And the second scenario is called random public input. This is, for instance, if M0 contains of a message and this message uh, and the entire state is then uh, uh, squeezed through the uh, F permutation. So we have then a, a random state and then we XOR M1, which might contain a key. Uh, onto this, so we have the first bits are, are, are secret and all the other bits are something uh, pseudo-random but known. And as it turns out, attacks in the second scenario, the random public input work a lot better. Uh, why is that? One potential reason is uh, in, in can be found in theta, where we have this so-called theta effect T, which is X or onto uh, five bits or five words of the state. And as an observation, we have that knowing uh, T, the theta effect, allows key recovery in our setting. Uh, and as it turns out, in our setting, we had a look at uh, four of the input nodes of, of such a, an XORing of, of, of feed of feed effect T are known. So these are public input and one of the inputs is secret. And in the all zero input, we add this, uh, this feed effect T onto four times zero. We have the same operation four times. Best we can do is averaging. So we don't get a lot of information from this XOR. Now in the random public input, we add this T to four different values. So this is kind of like a DPA which uses four traces and gives us a lot more information than just this averaging. And this is one reason why uh, the, this random public input scenario works a lot better. Now we uh, evaluated our tag for multiple uh, concrete scenarios. And uh, this is the result for a simulated leakage on an 8-bit device. And as it turns out, yes, uh, attacks in, on, in which want to recover a 128-bit key work a lot better. So with higher noise levels than those with a 256-bit key, we can also see that uh, attacks in the random public input scenario work better than in the all zero public input scenario. And just to uh, give a bit of context, we evaluated uh, the real noise level uh, on, on, a, on an 8-bit device and we found it to be roughly 0 0.5, which is well below uh, the, uh, which is well within uh, the noise levels that we can handle with our attack with quite a lot of margin. So uh, the attack works perfectly on 8-bit device in all scenarios. Now, for 16-bit Hemingway leakage, we didn't have a reference device. We don't have a real sigma, but we can also see that it still works, especially in the random public input. Uh, on the all-zero public input, it only works with 128-bit secrets, so no 256-bit secrets. And the success rate never reaches one in the year, actually. And for 32-bit Hemingway leakage, the real noise parameter quite varies a lot, so you will there we would need to uh, look into the more concrete applications. And in the 128-bit scenario, with random public input, the attack also works. So with all zero input, we, we didn't get it to work, and also with not with 256-bit keys. So what does this all tell us? This tells us that single trace attacks are still a considerable threat especially for 8- and 16-bit implementation. And while the situation might be less clear for 32-bit devices, here we can say that, yeah, we used a simple leakage model like simulations with univariate timing weight templates. And it's likely that uh, more sophisticated attacks will fare better. And here, rim like attackers using localized EM measurements. And that is not all that unrealistic that such an attacker exists because remember, uh, he can do the profiling directly on the device, in many cases at least. Uh, so this tells us that we always must include some basic countermeasures. We can't rely on the fact that the attacker only gets a single trace. And countermeasures might include hiding, like shuffling and dummy operations, these tend to be very effective at mitigating uh, all kinds of algebraic attacks at relatively low cost. 
Masking is of course also an option, but comes with some restriction, like for uh, on smaller devices, masking alone might not be enough because you might be able to, to still get in enough information if you combine the two shares uh, using uh, the factor graph and on larger on larger devices, it might masking might be a bit of an overkill. So the first step to mitigate this attack is probably through hiding. Uh, so that's it from my side. Uh, thank you for watching.